Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. With the voice, Milt Thompson. Delivering the best of sports programming. Interviews with top celebrities. And the answer to the question, where are they now? And now, Milt Thompson, playing for keeps. Good evening and welcome to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, The Voice, Milt Thompson. Welcome back every Friday evening right here on WHMB Channel 40. Uh, thank you so much for supporting our sponsors, uh, Steve Sander and Jeffy Lube. Uh, they're delighted by the kind of reaction they're getting and uh, Bleaky Dillon Crandall, the East Spot uh, Spas, uh, getting down to the heart of service in the sports business here in Indy. We're looking forward to uh, more opportunities to engage with you. As you know, over the last few weeks, we've had a uh, couple of months, we've had where are they now? And a couple of superstar celebrities, and maybe if I can get them to really work at it, maybe they'll reshow those two shows uh, uh, with uh, Ray Tolbert, uh, former, as you know, Mr. Basketball, uh, NCAA championship 1981 with the Indiana Hoosiers, and uh, also won a ring with the Los Angeles Lakers. What a great time with him. Uh, of course, Gary Brackett, you guys all know about him, uh, from Rutgers as really an undrafted uh, free agent and worked his way not only as on the team, but to be a star of the team and be a captain of the team and, uh, and what he's doing now in his entrepreneurial world. Uh, worked all his way up to get an MBA and do some other great things like that. Well, we've promised you we're going to get behind the scenes of some of these sports activities, and we've done that with the uh, uh, Leonard Hoops at Visit Indy and Ryan Vaughn of Sports Corporation and others that make things happen, along with Paul Nettig, IHSAA, and, and uh, Matt Wolfer of the IHSA Foundation. Uh, well, we're going to do that today with a very, very special guest today. Comes from a long sports family, a name that you'll recognize. And we're going to do that in the name of uh, the executive director, uh, president, or whatever you want to call it, of Lucas Oil Stadium. And that's Eric Newberger. And we're going to, we're going to uh, tee him up. We're going to talk about how he manages that big, huge operation down there and that big building and all the venues that they're prepared for and getting ready to do and have done. And we'll continue to do. But we're going to do that right after these short messages here on Playing for Keeps. We'll be right back. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. Welcome back to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, the voice, Milt Thompson. Thank you again for patronizing our great sponsors. And also thank you so much for viewing us and sending us all the kind of letters and emails and texts. You can continue to do that, you know, and you can always watch us uh, every Friday night here at 9 p.m. right here on WHMB Channel 40. Uh, follow up that on the YouTube station from Channel 40 and, and uh, get it out to your friends on social media because we were having fantastic guests just like we do today from sports royalty, if you will, around our neighborhood. Here's uh, uh, Eric Newberger. Eric, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for having me, Mel. Well, uh, when I talk about Newberger name, people around here uh, kind of uh, resonate with it. Uh, a lot with your, your dad, and he and I had so many engagements throughout the years. In fact, we recently traveled to Africa together, uh, working on some projects over there. Um, but uh, your, your background relative to your dad's and swimming and FINA mm -hmm. and all the other things that's going on, how did you get yourself in this world of sports growing up around it? Well, I really did grow up around it, and I was really lucky to have the opportunity to be immersed in the world's biggest sporting events from a very young age. So. Uh, it started back when I was volunteering for the U.S. Open Swimming Championships in the 1980s and running around a pool deck trying to make myself useful. And then uh, here I am today uh, continuing to work on these world's biggest events. So you went to a school that is known for its kind of sports programming, right? At uh, uh, OU, right. Ohio University. Tell us about that and how you get there, what kind of uh, things prepared you other than running around a pool deck to prepare you for running the biggest venue that we have here for sports uh, in our community. Well, I am a proud Ohio University graduate in their sports administration program. It's a graduate program I did studying business and sports administration. Um, I found myself there because I knew that I wanted to continue this, this career path after spending four years at Indiana University as an undergraduate managing uh, one of the programs there, interning in the, in the summer in the athletic department. I found myself really well prepared to go to OU, continue my education there, and then ultimately find a path here in this career. 
Well, I remember when I was general counsel for the Pan American Games, uh, are you as tough a negotiator as your dad? Because he was pretty tough on me as he were uh, negotiating the natatorium and the other things uh, that were around there at the IEPUI uh, campus at that time. Uh, I know you got some of those skills. I do. I, I had the opportunity to go to law school after that. And right. so uh, I continue to hone that, those skills as uh, I, I work uh, in the stadium today, work with promoters to come up with good deals for both sides and, and really make sure that we're uh, managing all the risks that go along with uh, running the, the biggest facility in the state. Well, it looks like fun, right? Uh, but there's something that goes on behind the scenes that maybe not just be so much fun, right? You've got to look at after uh, a staff of folks who work with the Capital Improvement Board. You mentioned other partners that you work with. Tell us a little bit about um, like what your day is like when you're kind of managing a, a facility that large. Right. Well, my responsibility as a Capital Improvement Board employee managing the, the stadium is to make sure that the team is in place ready to execute, that we are attracting events to the stadium and to the city and to the state, and that I'm working with those partners like the Sports Corporation and Visit Indy to bring trade shows, sporting events to the city, and that we execute those as flawlessly as possible so that we maintain our really great reputation as a community. You have a ton of events down there. Like, How many events do you guys do a year? And, and uh, it's not just a Colts facility, although you know they get a good piece of that action. Yeah, the, the Colts are our most important client, um, it, but we are the most uh, busy, uh, most used NFL stadium in the country with over 200 days of events in a normal non-pandemic year. And so uh, we have everything from dirt shows like monster trucks and supercross to trade shows like the performance racing industry, FDIC, uh, FFA. Uh, we have all sorts of events, um, including the, the minimum of 10 uh, NFL games that we have uh, in our normal rotation with the NCAA for the Final Four and other major events. Well, you know, uh, when I go to a Pacer game sometime and I see that halftime show uh, where they lift up the hoop and all of a sudden it's change o matic and they're all of a sudden into a different uh, costume. Sometimes I feel like that here too, Jeff, a little bit when we're changing between, between uh, taping of our shows. But can you imagine changing Lucas Oil Stadium in no time flat? I mean, tell me about the operations crew and what it takes to be able to change from one event to the next. I've got a great example for you. Uh, recently, we finished the National FFA Convention where we had 50,000 young people from around the country coming to their, their annual event in Indianapolis. That ended at 1.30 p.m. on a Saturday. At 1 p.m. Sunday, the next day, we were to be ready for the very important Indianapolis Colts game. So we had 73 rigging points from the ceiling. The field, uh, many people don't know, is always down. We cover it to do other things, so that had to be uncovered. Staging, uh, we had to bring in um, a, a crew of labor from all over the city and state to be able to turn that over, and we did it. By 7 o'clock in the morning when people were uh, arriving, getting ready for the NFL game, you wouldn't know that we had something so drastically different just 24 hours earlier. Dirt and mud and water and displacing stuff, moving people. People has to be interesting. Security. Tell us about kind of the operations around. Say that's a typical uh, Colt morning, Colt day. Um, you get up without a headache, and you get up and you say, "I'm going to avoid headaches by doing what?" Well, uh, if everything's going smoothly on a game day, I'm I'm really working with the team to make sure that uh, everything is up to our quality standards. Of course, if something does go wrong for an event. Uh, the scale of an NFL game, there's, there's things that happen throughout the day. And so what I do is I spend my time trying to make sure that uh, the most critical pieces of that get smoothed out, resolved, and then not repeated if, if we have that opportunity. So it really is uh, kind of a quality control, um, uh, leadership, and uh, trying to maintain that great standard for our clients. It's, it's a great team. Yeah, a great team. So how many folks have you got on operation? When you're, you're working with some union folks, some non-union folks, uh, stagehands, uh, you've got a, a lot of people that you have to kind of coordinate. Uh, um, how do you do that? On an Indianapolis Colts game day, for instance, there's 3,000 folks working for us in some way, shape, or form. We scale up and we scale down to, to meet the needs of whatever the client is. So we do. We have, we have trade unions. We have Teamsters. We have... 
uh, IATSE stage stagehands, really talented folks. And then we have the administrative staff and we have the housekeeping staff and we have everybody who makes that stadium run really smoothly and, and maintains that reputation. Well, I kind of like, you know, going to the uh, concession stands uh, when I'm down there for a game and or if you're in a club level seat or in a uh, fortunate enough every occasion to be in a suite level where it is you're getting all these accommodations. Those are a lot of moving parts. It is. We have uh, 139 uh, concession stands for a, for a major event like that, and those are all operated by distinct nonprofit groups who come in. They operate the stands. They, they receive a commission as a fundraiser for their organization, and it's been a really important part that, uh, of integrating the community into what we do while at the same time serving our guests. Sodexo Live is our third party uh, operator of our, our food service operation, and they really do a great job. Well, you know, it's always good to be the boss, right? But it's always, every, you're never really the boss. You're always reporting to someone. So you talk about the structure of Capital Improvement Board, mm -hmm. uh, Indianapolis Colts, when they kind of take over, they're the lessor, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, managers, if you will, they also have, um, they have to answer to the NFL. Um, when you open the roof, when you make the roof, how are those decisions kind of relayed in a communication system? Yeah, as a Capital Improvement Board employee, there are nine members of the Capital Improvement Board, I think you know, as a, a, right. your prior service. Right. Um, and those are appointed by the governor and by the mayor and some other uh, governmental entities. Those are our ultimate boss. And then right. uh, Andy Mallon, who's the executive director of the Capital Improvement Board, is my boss. And uh, the CIB, as we call it, uh, does, does own the... Uh, Cambridge Field House, Victory Field, the Indiana Convention Center, Lucas Oil Stadium, and it's my job to, to run the stadium. So that's, that's kind of how we organize things. Communication with the, uh, the Colts have been a terrific partner. I work day to day with Pete Ward, a longtime right. chief operating officer. Um, and so when you think about the roof opening and closing, uh, per our lease, as you, as you mentioned, the, the, the Colts ownership uh, makes that determination as long as it's within the mechanical and weather parameters that, that we have set. And that has to be decided 90 minutes prior to kickoff. And so sometimes it's, it's not clear cut what to do. And fan comfort is, is the most important factor that, that the Colts use to make that decision on a Colts game day. It takes about 9 to 11 minutes to open or close that roof. Uh, it's, it's quite a production. It's awe-inspiring when you look up and you see the sky opening up. It's really a cool part of the job. And even some magical moments where it's not the professional athlete, but sometimes the high school athletes, uh, all the way filtering down to uh, um, the IHSA championships that are there and uh, maybe having four or five games in a, in a weekend and changing uh, broadcast crew, crew, crews and making sure the lighting and all these logistical things happen. Um, tell us about uh, um, your coordination with those other organizations that are not the NFL. Well, we are very client focused. So uh, when we att attract an event to the venue, we immediately start working with them. We assign an event manager to that client to really document everything that needs to be done. And you should see some of these event documents that we are able to put out before an event. And, and you'll see they're, they're sometimes close to 100 pages of table, chair placement to different parts of the building that need to be prepared for certain activities. And we really pride ourselves on being able to be whatever anybody needs us to be. And so you could walk into a room one day and it's set up like a classroom. And then the next day it's a, it's a, 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 a rock star's dressing room. And so it, it, we're very versatile in that way. So having that legal and MBA kind of background uh, prepares you uh, not only for the operational side, but actually tracking and reading these documents. Well, there's, a, there's something in those contracts uh, once upon a time, as you well know, called force majeure, mm -hmm. uh, which means, you know, you can activate insurance if it was truly an act of God. Well, some people are real concerned about that pandemic uh, not being an act of God, not being able to activate, and all of a sudden you see yourself getting prepared for a March Madness mm -hmm. with all those coordinated entities, but all of a sudden you're not going to have anybody there, and, and no, no, no fans, or even for a typical NFL game with a limited fan base. So how do you, how do you make all that work? Well, if you can kind of picture for a moment that day in March of 2020 when uh, we had 400 dump trucks loads of dirt on the field, ready to go, ready for Supercross that was going to be the next day. And that's when the decision was made that there were to be no events. And so everybody walked out of the building, except for a few of us who were standing there looking at these mounds of dirt, thinking, gosh, this is unusual. Never thought we'd see something like this. That first year of the pandemic 
was very difficult for our industry and for the events industry. But I think Indianapolis really rallied around what we're good at, and that's, that's being the right thing at the right time. And we uh, came up with a slate of events, starting with the Indy 11 that started in July, where we had fans. We have the challenges, but we're also able to meet the challenge because we have great leaders like Eric Newberger out there at Lucas Oil Stadium. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about some of these great events that are going to be coming up that's on his slate of things to check out. Come right back here on Playing for Keeps. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. And welcome back to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, The Voice, Milt Thompson. And thanks again to our wonderful sponsors. When you talk to Steve Sander out there and you go get your uh, oil changed, you know that you're going to Jiffy Lou. That's the only place to go in town to really get that accomplished. I know that's where we go, right? Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll use our other sponsors and, uh, and also send out the good word that you've been watching this show and have really been enjoying it. And so make sure that all your friends on social media can uh, take a look in and see what we've got going on here. And uh, we've been talking with my good friend Eric Newberger. Comes from uh, aristocracy of sports families around here, the New Newbergers. And, and uh, uh, he uh, uh, has the privilege of working in Lucas Oil Stadium. Now, I hope they don't have fleas running around there uh, no, <laughs> no one open, you, you, they, they, they're repelled automatically uh, when you have no people there but all of a sudden you got to rent back up and have 60,000 people down there uh, almost with no notice and so tell us how you get your staff and everyone prepared to uh, greet the greet the audiences again well it really is like restarting an engine that hasn't been running for some time uh, we were on cutbacks and all sorts of things even during the, those difficult parts of the beginning of the pandemic and uh, so starting it back up was really getting everybody back in the groove of having daily events and daily meetings and making sure that our clients were being serviced and that all the differences, the post-pandemic or, or uh, you know, the changes that we have needed to implement to continue to operate this way, were, were in place. So we upped our, our cleaning. We did it more visibly. We really made the team members that do that cleaning look good and, and, and stick out and, and, and allow us to show our appreciation for them. So that's how we do it. That's a, I mean, that, that, that adds a really interesting element, um, the health protocols, mm -hmm. how it changed, and uh, um, having cleaning stations around and, uh, uh, and sanitation stations and uh, uh, having um, ticketless ticket passes. Tell us how that got implemented and changed to how we all uh, uh, take in special events these days. Well, some of those were, were uh, due to the health department's uh, recommendations and advisories and mandates, and some of them were our own decisions or the decisions of our clients. So what we tried to do is we tried to take a really reasoned approach based on the science and based on the advice we were getting from all of our clients to come up with things. Sometimes that included a lot of testing, and we were all getting tested quite often uh, as we approached March Madness and other major events. But we had other events leading up to that too, and they all took a little bit of different turn. Uh, some uh, had a, a stricter enforcement of, of some of the protocols, and some were more advisory. So we really tried to do what was best for that particular event, because all events are not the same. Right, so your revenues derive through CIB as well as through ticket activity, tax dollars, what's that mix of stuff mm -hmm. um, that you and your boss, how are, how are they funded and how do you run your budgets? Yeah, so we are a public entity, right? And so it's, uh, we, we do receive the, the benefits of many of the tourism taxes that, that Indianapolis um, has, has implemented. But where I spend most of my time is focusing on the operational revenue, making sure that events make sense, that they're good deals for both the venue and for the promoter so that everybody's happy and wants to come back. That's, that's how, we, how we do it. So we look for concerts, we look for our friends at Feld who put on those dirt shows like Monster Truck that, that really have a great product that people are interested in and they come back. And then of course there's the, the hotel use and we always try to factor into events that we're trying to attract what that impact is going to be for the city of Indianapolis and for this region and for the state. And those are really important parts because um, we want to we want to make money so that we can operate, but we want the community to have all that activity that really makes us a robust downtown, a cool place to live. We can attract people from all over the country to come work here in Central Indiana. That's an important part of what we do. I was always interested in the design, so I had the opportunity to participate a little bit in the kind of mm -hmm. a bond issuing for that place and what have you. But the design that's connected to the convention center. 
I know it was a little bit of a myth that we used to, to build the, the old Hoosier Dome <laughs> by saying that's an expansion of convention space, right? But it truly is an expansion of expansion, expansion space connected to the other facilities. Um, what does that do for you operationally and how you hook those up and how you operate with other managers? Well, it's our bread and butter. It really is. Uh, there's no other NFL stadium in the country that has exhibit halls within the building, and that doesn't even include the tunnel that connects us to the Indiana Convention Center. So when we have really big trade shows coming to the city, they take up the entire Indiana Convention Center and the entire Lucas Oil Stadium. And that can really be a seamless operation. We share many of the same staff. We share the same policies. We're really able to make the, the venue become a great big ballroom for the use of, of the folks that come in from out of town. Well, tell us briefly about reg the regular, every year, uh, Big Ten Championship game um, that uh, uh, happens uh, every December uh, at the Lucas Oil Stadium, and about that long-term kind of deal that we got sole sourced with, and lead that into the big get uh, is the national championship game that comes up here, uh, here later in January. Yeah, so the Big Ten championship game is really important to us. We have a, a partnership in, in Indianapolis with the Colts and the Pacers and the Sports Corporation to bring that event to town. And we're the only venue that's ever hosted the football championship game. Um, really excited that in, in 2021 that Iowa and Michigan taking part in that. Uh, uh, some some first time and there will be a first time winner at that, right, at that right. game, right? And so um, those, are, those are really important. And I think that our reputation, much of the work you've done over the decades to make Indianapolis known for this type of thing, uh, we were approached by the college football playoff, a, a group of folks in town here, and we, we uh, determined that we would make this the biggest event that we've had since the Super Bowl. And, well, and it's been great. We we pulled off a Super Bowl, you know, in the wintertime, and mm -hmm. that's not very usual for the NFL to do that because that week surrounding that, they want to play golf with all of their constituencies and, and partners. So the, with the NCAA um, having their big football game and not in Florida or California or Arizona, uh, it's not Miami here in January, so what are we doing that's different, and mm -hmm. what are we going to do that's make sure, just like we did the Super Bowl, leave a long-time legacy so this won't be the last time they come? Yeah. Well, this will be the first northern city to host the college football playoff. I believe it's year number eight of the, the current situation. And Bill Hancock and his team have put together a program that really works in a lot of cities. But I don't think there's a lot of places north that could pull off the event the way they'd really like to see it. And I think that's what Indianapolis is going to do. We have the downtown that is built for big events with concerts on Monument Circle with some great headlining acts. Uh, uh, culinary activities, a 5K race. This really brings the world of college football to Indianapolis for the first time ever in such a big way. Well, we've got not only the biggest venue, but we have the best venue. That's because we have the best people that are operating them. Um, that's uh, why we have uh, the likes of Eric Newbergers uh, in charge of making that happen. And uh, cause I know that our folks at home, they're uh, kind of curious what goes on during game day, but they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. So your parting shots to these folks here that are uh, interested in, in seeing the best operation going uh, when they're down there, what do you tell them about enjoying themselves? Well, I hope people do come to the stadium, pick an event, whether it's a big or a small one, and come and enjoy the food. We have really great stuff there. You can get some Colts gear. You can see some of the biggest attractions uh, that this country has right in Indianapolis. We're really proud of it, and we hope people come. Right here at Lucas Oil Stadium, you're getting the best <laughs> that we have. Eric, thank you so much for appearing on our show. And I know that folks back there and here watching our show this evening and throughout the rest of the season, that they're going to come down to Lucas Oil Stadium, become a patron and a, a patron that's going to pay and enjoy themselves <laughs> to the maximum. You know what? That's what you do every time you watch us here on Playing for Keeps. Uh, come back here this time next week. I'm your host, The Voice, Milk Thompson.